All right, it is 10 o'clock. We got our recording going, so um, I will get started. And we have a little bit that we have to pick up from Friday. Um, so we're gonna start there and then jump, or sorry, pick up from um, Wednesday. So we'll start there and um, then go to Friday stuff. Let me get this in uh, presentation mode. All right, so where we left off on Wednesday is that we were talking about the different groups in the periodic table, and we were just looking at the um, big columns, the big groups. So you have your alkali metals, your alkali earth metals. And when it says group 1A and one, uh, 2A, so we're just looking up here and we're talking about columns. Note that hydrogen is not an earth metal. Even though hydrogen appears on that side of the periodic table, it is actually a non-metal. So it's more along um, the halogen side. Um, so we have your alkali metals, your alkaline earth metals, so 2A, your halogens, uh, 7A, and your noble gases. And we briefly talked about uh, the properties of those. Uh, I rewatched the last class. I'm feeling more use most of something. Oh, no worries, Kevin. I'm glad that it um, is making more sense to you. Um, so what I want to start with is how we can determine the charges of atoms um, during a chemical reaction. So just as a uh, remind reminder, there are two types of ions we have in chemistry. One we have are cations. Cations are positive or positive. And we have anions which are negative, all right? So in general, the way it works is that if you are a metal, you're gonna be positive. If you're a non-metal, you're gonna be negative. That, that's the big broad strokes. But what charge are you gonna be? Um, so all of the alkali earth metals in this first group, they're all gonna be a plus one. Um, everything in our second column, except beryllium, beryllium's the odd ball out, that's always going to be plus two in a reaction. Like you'll never find calcium plus one, for example, it's always going to be plus two. Your halogens will be minus one. Your group six will be minus two. Nitrogen will be minus three and aluminum will be plus three. So these these atoms that are being shown on this chart are um, charges that will never be like different. In any chemical reaction, aluminum is always going to be like a plus three when it reacts with something else. Now, why do we have these unique, or why do we have these charges that are always like plus one, plus two? Um, we'll get into this later in the semester, but basically, atoms want to have the same electron configuration as the noble gases. So noble gases have what are called a full octet, and we don't need to worry about that right now, but we just need to know noble gases are inert. They're really stable because the amount of electrons that they have. And so other elements, when they react, they try to have the same number of electrons as our noble gases. And so the way that this works is that if you move right on the periodic table, you gain an electron. So for example, chlorine, the closest noble gas it, it's near to is argon. To occupy argon square in the periodic table, chlorine just needs to move right once. Since it moved right once, it gains an electron. Oxygen, the closest noble gas to oxygen is neon. To get to neon, oxygen needs to move two squares over. 
when it moves two squares to the right, it gains two electrons, that gets a negative two charge. Sodium, sodium's nearest um, noble gas is also neon. However, to get to neon, sodium needs to move to the left once to get to neon. When you move to the left, you lose an electron, you become a positive. So it's only moved to the left once, it becomes a positive one. Magnesium has to move to the left twice to get the neon, it becomes a positive two. Are we gonna be reviewing electron configurations this semester? We will look at electron configurations in about eight weeks, I would say. So um, this is just a brief introduction to charges of atoms without actually getting into what the electron configurations are. Right now, all we need to know are the different types of groups we have, what are some characteristics, on the periodic table, where can we find a metal versus a non-metal versus a metalloid? And what are the common charges, or what are the charges that don't change for us? What atoms have constant charges? Um, so that's all we need to know right now. Um, we don't need to know electron configurations until later. So at this point, if you haven't got a periodic table yet, I again, I will remind you from Wednesday, I strongly recommend you have one somewhere, either printed out or another screen, because we're gonna be using it a lot. Um, especially today, we'll be using it quite a bit. So let's just move on to some basics of the periodic table. So I have five elements here, A, B, C, D, and E. I want you to give me the full name on the element, I want you to tell me what charge of ion we're gonna make. I want you to tell me if this element's a metal, a non-metal, or a metalloid. And then if it's alkali metal, earth metal, halogen, or noble gas, or neither could also be an option. So we're just gonna start here with a little bit of exploration of our periodic table and see if we get the concepts that were presented on the um, last So this is really a good time to just get familiar with our tool of the periodic table. You know, it's been a while or if you've never used one before. Um, but since there's a, um, a lot of math uh, in a little bit, I will kind of just uh, move this along. Um, so for A, we have F. F is element nine. So F is element nine. And when we look at F, we see that element nine has the name of fluorine. So what's the charge? Well, fluorine is one away from neon. To get to neon, it has to move to the right once. When we move to the right once, we get a negative one charge, so that's the ion. All halogens will always be negative one. It's on the right side of the periodic table, so it's non-metal. And it's in the column right next to our noble gases. Those are our halogens. All right, next is K. K for potassium, yes. So if you see uh, um, K in chemistry, even though potassium doesn't have a K, it stands for potassium. Um, potassium is right next to krypton that's its nearest noble gas. I have to move to the left to get it, so that is plus one. Uh, it is a metal, because it's on the left-hand side of the periodic table, and this is an alkali metal in our first column.
Will all of 7A be minus one? Yeah, for, for the ones we care about, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine will always be minus one in a um, reaction. They will always form minus one ions. Neon, NE is neon. All right, charge. It's a noble gas. Neon, a noble gases don't form charges, so charge is zero. Uh, noble gases are nonmetals. And um, noble gas, just said it already. That's neon. Okay, magnesium. Magnesium, element 12. So that's magnesium. Uh, it's uh, alkali earth metal. So basically all alkali earth metals are plus two. It's a metal because it's on the left-hand side. Alkali earth metal. Oh, for oxygen. Uh, G in there. So oxygen is two to the left of neon. So I need to move two to the right to get the neon. Every time I move to the right, I get a negative charge. So oxygen is like always going to be minus two in a reaction. Uh, oxygen is a nonmetal because it's on the left or uh, right hand side of our periodic table. And it is not any of the categories I gave you to name it. It's not a halogen, so um, it doesn't get a fancy name. But yeah, that's just our introduction to the periodic table and some of the trends in the periodic table. Are there um, any, any questions about that before I move on to the math today? All right, let me clear my drawings and pop up today's um, PowerPoint. So let's stop sharing that. Share 9.4. Okay. So what we're going to look at today is um, doing more or less doing unit conversions now for chemistry. Um, but we're going to start by combining our knowledge of isotopes and looking at the periodic table. So on the periodic table, under each element, you will see a number. This number is the atomic mass of that element. And you'll notice that they're never like round numbers. It's not 35, 36. It are, there's always decimals there, which is a little odd when you consider that I said, you know, protons have a weight of one AMU, neutrons have a weight of one AMU, electrons are basically weightless. We don't count those. So why do we get uh, elements that aren't like 35 or 36. And that's because of this idea of isotopes we talked about. If you remember, an isotope is, an, is our elements that have the same number of protons versus uh, different numbers of neutrons. And when you get a sample of like pure chlorine, it will be a mixture of isotopes. However, the mixture will always be exact. For example, you'll always have a certain percentage versus another, another certain percentage. That, that fraction will never change. So when we talk about the weight of an element, we consider the weight of isotopes multiplied by how abundant those isotopes, is, uh, isotopes are. And that's what this equation is, this atomic mass equation. And it says, uh, so for those of us who, you know, it's been a while for math class, this big E, this means sum. So th this epsilon just says, add everything that you're gonna do over there. So it's the sum of the fraction of isotope N multiplied by the mass of isotope N. So if you have three isotopes, right? You want to know what the fraction of isotope one is multiplied by its mass. Fraction of isotope two multiplied by its mass 
three by three, and then you add them all together at the end. Um, to give you a practical like example of it, not just math equations, uh, let's look at our friend chlorine here. So chlorine has two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Whoops, Cl37. Now, when you weigh these using like very advanced um, uh, scales, more or less, um, you'll see chlorine 35 is 34.97 AMU and chlorine 37 is 36.97 AMU. And the abundance, the abundance of chlorine 35 is 75.77% and the abundance of chlorine 37 is 24.23%, all right? So now let's, let's do this equation. The lower screen is not visible. Um, what, what lower screen? Um, not, I'm not sure what you mean by lower screen. Um, but let me know if you can't see what I'm writing because that would, that would be like a, a big problem. We only see half a chlorine. Like you can't see chlorine three, five, four, five. Or is the, is the word chlorine like chopped off? Because if the word, if just the word chlorine is chopped off, that's fine. Oh yeah, yeah, you only see three, five point four five, that's fine. Um, underneath that, it just says chlorine. So you're not, you're not missing anything. Yeah, so, so that's our weights. And that's our abundances, all right? So let's do this, this math equation to figure out the weight of chlorine. So we have the fraction of isotope one. So isotope one, I'm gonna say is chlorine 35. So I'm gonna call that I1. The fraction is basically the percentage divided by 100. So you take that percentage and you divide by 100. So the fraction of isotope one is 0.7577. And that's gonna be multiplied by the mass of isotope one, which is 34.97. I'm gonna add that to the fraction of, of isotope two, which is 0.2423, multiplied by the weight of chlorine 37, uh, 36.97. So you do those two and you add them up together. And that is how you get the weight of 35.45. You notice that the actual overall weight of chlorine, it's closer to chlorine 35, the weight is, than to chlorine 37 because the abundance of chlorine 35 is much greater than the abundance of chlorine 37. So any weights you see in the periodic table, they are gathered from using this atomic mass equation. So are there any general questions about that equation? What it says, how to use it? Otherwise, I'm gonna clear this drawing. So clear that. One sec. Can you show AMU part? Um, so like how I got that chlorine 35 is 34.97 AMU. If you mean that, I just looked that up. That's not a calculation. That's, that's just a given. Um, if you're talking, yeah, so like, how I got 34.97 AMU and 36.97 AMU, I just looked that up online. You would not, you could not know that without doing an experiment. And then you just take your weights, multiplied by your abundances, add them together to get your final answer of 35.45. Does that answer your question about the AMU part? 
I'm not I'm not quite sure if, if that's what you're getting at. Okay, so let's clear all this. It's one thing to hear me say it, and when you hear me say it, you might think, oh, I got it. It's another thing for you to do it. All right, so here's a question. Silicon has three isotopes, 28, 29, and 30. The mass and abundance of 28 are given. The mass and abundance of 29 are given. With all that information, tell me what the mass and abundance of SI30 are if silicon itself on the periodic table has a weight of 28.09 AMD. So I'll give everybody a few minutes to work on that. Are we needing to know these formulas? Um, I will probably put the formulas on a formula sheet. Uh, you need to know how to use them though. So like I might, for the test, I'll probably give you a formula sheet and not, not like list what the formulas are for. So you'll just have a giant sheet of formulas and you just have to know how to use them. But yeah, so let's try to use this equation to figure out the mass and abundance of silicon 30. So for this uh, problem, of course, whoops, let me get my pen out again. We are going to be using this equation. And I would try to fill out as much of that equation as you can and see what variables you have. And if you're completely stuck, like I don't know where to begin at all, see if you can figure out the natural abundance because to figure out the natural abundance, you don't need any, you don't need this equation, right? Um, because everything should add, add up to 100%. Uh, so there was a question of, do we need to look at the periodic table? For this question, you do not need the periodic table at all. Everything you need to solve this problem is given to you on this um, PowerPoint slide. Yeah, so a good place to start, I would say, is just see if you can logic out what is natural abundance of SI30 if you know that there's only three isotopes, so there's only three isotopes, SI28 and SI29 and SI30, and that makes up 100% of your silicon. So I give you the percentages for two, and what's the percentage of the last one? That's your first goal. So it looks like um, some people have it. Uh, so if we look at this, um, silicon 28, um, the percentage is 
92.9% plus silicon 29 is 4.67% plus silicon 30. I don't know what that is. So I'm going to put that as X that equals 100%. Solve for X and you should get that that is 3.13%. Uh, um, due to sig figs, um, the significant figure answer would be 3.1% um, because what you're doing is you're, you're basically doing um, 100 minus 90, and this 100 is going on forever, 100 minus 92.9 minus 4.67. So you should only have one number at the, after the decimal, but yes, 3.13%. Once you have that, you have all the tools you need to figure out the abundance of silicon 30. So I'll give people just like a minute or two to try last minute to try to work on that. And then I'm gonna switch to a whiteboard because I need more space to work out this problem. What is after and? Um, I don't see any and. Uh, 30.34. Oh, okay, so you can see it now, good. Uh, right, so if you're still working on it, great. Um, I'm gonna go to um, a whiteboard now to give myself a little more space. So I'm gonna stop sharing this. And I'm gonna share a whiteboard. Okay. So our equation is, you know, abundance. So I'm just gonna say A of isotope one multiplied by mass of isotope one plus abundance of isotope two times mass of isotope two plus abundance isotope three times mass isotope three. That equals our atomic mass and the atomic mass we were given for silicon is 28.09. All right, so if we look back on the problem, our abundance for isotope one was 0.922, because it was 92.2%. Divided that by 100 to get 0.922. Multiplied by the mass, so the mass is given, was 27.9769 AMU. Plus abundance of isotope two, uh, same idea, 0 0.0467. Multiplied by the weight of isotope two, 28.9765 plus the abundance of isotope three. Well, that's what we figured out. So 0 0.313, cause it was 3.13% divided by hundred multiplied by the mass of isotope three. We do not know that equals 28.09 AMU. So you can see just by writing out our equation here, we only have one unknown, the mass of isotope three. So we can just use algebra from here on out to solve for the mass of isotope um, three. So you take 27.9769 multiplied by 0 0.92 uh, and you get 25.7947 plus 
do the same, do a similar multiplication for isotope two, you get plus 1.353 plus 0 0.0313 and mass of isotope three. So that's a weird variable, but I'm gonna stick with it. Mass of isotope three. And this is all equal to 28.09. All right, so now I have uh, simplified my math. I have my variable attached to a number, so it's being multiplied by a number. So remember from algebra, we want to get our variable to one side only. So we're gonna do the reverse order of operation and just do some subtraction first. So I subtract 25.7947 from each side. I subtract 1.353 from each side. And I get 0 0.0313 ma multiplied by mass equals 0 0.9423. All right, now I'm just left with my mass multiplied by a number. So I just divide each side by 0 0.0313 now. And when you do that, you get the mass of isotope three is roughly equal to, and I'm gonna put those roughly because um, I, I chopped off the number, 30.39 AMU. Okay, and sig figs. So um, I didn't show all the sig figs that um, we were going through on this problem, but what's gonna matter at the end is the sig figs of um, this 0 0.0313. So, um, when we uh, figured out the abundance, I said that this number, whoopsies. So you calculate it out and it's 3.13%, but I only said those two digits were significant, the three and the one. So this number only has two sig figs, right? Um, and so I kept this three here, this extra three, so I didn't have a rounding error, but your number actually should only have two sig figs with it. And so the number in the correct way to report it is 30 uh, AMU. So the full answer, if you look at all the digits in a real experiment, you'd have more than two digits is 30.39 uh, AMU. But the way we did the calculation, it's only 30 AMU. And this makes sense. Um, this isotope was silicon 30 right? It should have a weight of about 30. If you're getting a weight that was not 30, uh, you probably did some calculation incorrectly because the weight should be roughly 30. Do, do, do. How did I turn? Um, so the way I turned 3.13% into 0.0313 is I divided by 100. Because when you're using fractions, right, um, you, you want to, when you're doing this, you can't use the um, percentage. You want to use the fraction. The way to turn, turn a percentage into a fraction is divided by 100, right? So um, I didn't turn 0.0313 to 0.313. I changed 3.13% to 0.0313%. Um, the way I changed 30.39 to 30 AMU is I rounded down there. Yes, yeah, so that was rounding due to significant figures. Um, but I didn't do any rounding for that 3.13%. All right. I did everything you did, but I got 30.0989. Does this matter? Um, I am wondering because they do not round to the same thing after the decimal. Uh, they should round down to the same thing if you look at sig figs, because it would be rounding down to 30. Um, so it doesn't matter, probably not all that much. Um, some kind of, I could have put in like one digit wrong in my calculator. And, um, and so, um, that that could be why we got different answers. So it could have just been like, and I do that quite a bit actually, where I actually put in like a seven to a six. So 
Um, how do I get 0.9423 again? Do, 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 do. Oh, so I get, so I set up my equation, right? And I get 28.09 equals all this stuff on the left-hand side. And I want my variable alone. So you take 28.09 and you subtract 25.7947 from it. And you also subtract 1.353 from it to get down to this, this part of the equation and you're left with 0.9423 equals a variable. Um, so that's how I got 0.9423. It was just doing algebra to uh, simplify the equation that was above it, just doing subtraction. Anything else? Yeah, you, you round down the sig fig because it's less than five. If, if it was 30.5, you'd actually round up to 31, but here it's not. All right, anything else about this before I, I delete this whiteboard? And so don't be surprised, and I'll reiterate this again, don't be surprised for the problems we're doing during this lecture if, if they pop up again, like on a test. So um, that's why we do them, to make sure if we have practice, to make sure people understand it. And so when you see it like on a test, uh, you won't be surprised. It won't be new to you, hopefully. So uh, this is the time to get that mastery. And then the test to show me that you have that mastery. So. Again, questions are always, always welcome. Um, but if there are no other questions, I will move on to more unit conversion fun. Let's stop sharing this. And let's share my PowerPoint again. Uh, we do have a question. Um, so, if, if you don't understand, uh, we can talk about that uh, more in private, um, other than like uh, going through that whole, whole um, question again, um, because I need to uh, go on to our next one. But yeah, that's something we can discuss one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Or um, let me just plug again, our SI, um, who has uh, sessions Monday and Tuesday, he's also uh, capable of working through these as well. Um, in case you want another explanation. All right, so let's talk about molar mass now. So we just looked at how we can um, calculate that molar mass by using isotopes, right? Now, when we talk in chemistry terms, there are a different different ways we can talk about the amount of stuff in chemistry. Uh, one we just saw was weight. So we can talk about it in terms of weight and weight's gonna be like in grams or kilograms or milligrams or what have you. Um, we can also talk about it in terms of atoms if we wanted to, like how many atoms are reacting in an equation. And that's how we actually write equations, right? So. Um, just, just as an example, um, uh, C plus 4H equals uh, CH4. So some just random equation I wrote there, carbon plus four hydrogens goes to CH4. So we're saying one carbon atom, so one carbon atom plus four hydrogen atoms will make an element, methane. So in chemistry, we want to know how many atoms are reacting at any given time. But an atom is so small, it's kind of pointless to say, you know, I have 100 billion atoms in this test tube. You would never say that. Instead, what chemists have is called the mole. And the mole is just a way to um, count a large number of things, right? Um, it's similar to a gross. Those of you who do shopping or uh, baking, uh, a gross, I believe, is 144 objects. 
So and say, instead of saying like, I need to buy 144 eggs, you can just say, I need a gross of eggs. It's a way to just simplify your language. Uh, we have the same thing. In chemistry, we say one mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23 things. A mole can be anything. You can have a mole of like elephant, a mole of trees. But in chemistry, we're, every time you see the mole, it's going to be atoms, right? So one mole equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms. This number is called Avogadro's number. Um, so 6.022 times 10 to 23 is named after the guy who uh, created that number. His name was Avogadro. That's why it's Avogadro's number. Also, October 23rd, um, it's called Mole Day. Uh, if you have any friends who are science nerds and you follow them on Facebook, you might see them post something about Mole Day on October 23rd. Uh, that's where it's coming from. That, so that's when like all the chemists get together and be like, yay, we're chemistry nerds. Let's celebrate with, with food. Um, so that's October 23rd. Now, when we talk about the mass of an element, so like the number we just calculated, that mass is actually the weight of one mole of atoms. So for silicon, silicon has a weight of 28.09. So you can actually say that's 28.09 AMU, or you can say 28.09 grams per mole. So that says, what, what this unit means is that one mole of silicon atoms equals 28.09 grams. Right, so that's that's what molar mass means. Remember, a mole is just a way of saying 6.022 times 10 to 23 atoms equals 28.09 grams. One mole equals that, equals Avogadro's number. So, any questions? about that information. Right. So let's clear this. So let's do some questions. We are going to use do unit conversion in terms of um, uh, chemistry now. So every, all the unit conversion stuff we did last week was non-chemistry more or less, so it's just metric. Here we're gonna use those skills for chemistry purposes. Um, and so I'm just gonna do, uh, let's see, I will do B, B to get us started. So um, B, what is the amount of moles of 3.55 grams of zinc, all right? So to do this, you need a periodic table and you find zinc. So um, the first time you use a periodic table, you're just gonna be randomly searching for these elements until you get a better feel for those. But zinc is element 30. Zinc has a weight of 65.38 grams per mole, right? So that's what it says on our periodic table. Zinc has that weight. So I wanna know if I have 3.55 grams of zinc, how many moles is that? This is just a simple unit conversion. So we start with what we know. We know we have 3.55 grams of zinc. And my conversion between grams and moles is my molar mass. I know that 65.38 grams is one mole of zinc. Right? So grams cancel out, and I'm left in the unit of moles of zinc. So now it's the train tracks that we all know and love. So 3.55 divided by 65.38 is 0 0.0543 moles of zinc. If I did my math right, three sig figs, because this only has three sig figs. 
Uh, so if your periodic table says that it's 65.39, it doesn't. That That's going to be so much of a, um, so small of a difference that your calculation won't be off. Yeah, different periodic tables will be slightly different on their masses. All right. So I'm going to give people a couple minutes to try to do A, C, and D. Um, and then um, in about three minutes time, I, I will um, fill those in. And that's where we will call it a, a session as we're almost done here. But if you have questions while going through this or just want to check your answers, of course, let me know via chat. All right, for the sake of time, um, I, I will um, uh, go, go on and solve the other ones here quickly. Um, so I do have a question. So for B, could you write it as 0.543 times 10 to the minus one? Yes, you, would, you can write it as um, 5 0.543 times 10 to the minus one if you wanted to, it, it doesn't matter. Um, so let's, let's do, uh, A. So A, I have 5.52 moles. Avogadro's number says one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23. Moles cancel out and I'm left with atoms because that's what Avogadro's number is. So you just multiply the top. Uh, across each other, and you get 3.32 times 10 to the 24 atoms. So that's fairly simple, right? It's just moles to atoms, you use Avogadro's number. That's your conversion. That's going to convert between moles and atoms. If you're having still having trouble thinking about that, um, I always go back to the fact that you know how to do unit conversion with other things. So just use that um, knowledge and try to apply it to chemistry. What I mean by that is, you know that one hour equals 60 minutes, not 65, 60 minutes, right? So if I said, you know, if I had 5.52 hours, how many minutes is that? It's no different than what I'm asking in A. Right? If I have 5.52 moles, how many atoms do I have? I'm just using scientific terms. But I have faith that we know how to do unit conversions if it wasn't like, if I didn't put chemistry terms near it, but it's the same idea. All right, C, what is the mass of 0.0355 moles of BA? Um, so we gotta find BA on a periodic table. BA is barium. Barium is element 56. So if we look at that, we see barium has a weight of 137.328 grams per mole. All right. And so I want to know what the mass is in grams. So I start with 0 0.0355 moles. One mole 
is 137.328 grams. Moles cancel out, I'm left in a unit of grams. So I'm good to go on my conversion. Now I can just multiply. When you do this multiplication, you get this is equal to 4.88 grams. Simple enough, I hope. D is where we're going to use all three things combined. And I will say, if, if you are struggling with this, um, for, question, for this question, I would highly suggest uh, you go back to it during this holiday weekend without any of my writing down and see if you can solve it again. See if it clicks for you. Um, basically, practice is the only way you're going to um, really get good at this. Um, just practice, practice, practice. So D, I start with atoms. I'm trying to go to mass of manganese. Notice this is not magnesium. It is manganese, manganese which has the element Mn. The weight of manganese is 54.938 grams per mole. So I'm, I'm going to do this a little fast because we are out of time here. So the video is always uploaded for you to relook at. So I start with atoms. I have 1.22 times 10 to the 27 atoms. And what I'm going to do first, and I'm, not I'm going to show you how to do this conversion without any numbers, just logically. Logically, I want to get to grams or technically kilograms. The only way I can go to grams from a different unit is by moles. So I need to get to moles first. So I know, I know my next conversion, I have to end up in moles. So I need to convert from atoms to moles. Well, I have a conversion for that. It's called Avogadro's number. 6.022 times 10 to 23 atoms for one mole, right? So using Avogadro's number, I can convert from atoms to moles. Next, I can go from moles to grams using molecular weight here. So moles to grams. Well, my conversion is for manganese, one mole is 54.938 grams. Moles cancel out. I'm left in a unit of grams. Now I want kilograms. Well, that's one of those conversions we need to know for the test. 1,000 grams is one kilogram. Grams cancel out. I'm left in a unit of kilograms. And so you can see just following the unit, following how I canceled out units, you're left in your final unit of kilograms which means you know you did the setup right. Now, I will warn you, if you try to put this all in your calculator at once without any parentheses, I'm gonna guess you'll probably get the wrong answer because your operations will be different than what you thought they would be. So I would highly suggest multiply everything on the top first and then parent, divided by parentheses 6.022 times 10 to 23, um, and then take that number and divide by 1,000. And what you should get is 111.299 kilograms. Um, in our sig figs, 1.22, we have three sig figs here, so our number will only be three sig figs, 111 kilograms. So our answer is 111. Um, so I know I went through D a little quick, um, just because we were out of time there. Um, so again, I would highly suggest um, try these on the weekend. Um, if you want other examples, email me and I can link you to websites that just have examples of these. Um, Rewatch this part of the video and see if you can follow along the unit conversion. Again, these are no different than any conversion we have done. I'm just using chemistry terms for the first time now. Um, yeah, so that will end our class here.
if you have any last minute questions, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, just some announcements. One, um, I'll put a homework up that I'll be due on Sunday again. Um, so you'll have three homeworks due this Sunday. Monday is a holiday, so there will be no class Monday, no quiz Monday, no reading guide Monday. So the next time that we will meet for a class here is Wednesday. If you have questions about anything we did, right, any of the math, and you're still unsure after looking at examples, please email me and we can set up some kind of time to do that look over stuff. Otherwise, um, let me know if you have problems with your homework and I will see people on Wednesday. Have a good holiday break, everybody.